and welcome everyone. It is a pleasure to have all of you join us today from different parts of our communities across Canada. It is an honor today to share this webinar with you on thank you so thank you so much for joining us for the equity versus equality pardon me versus equity webinar. This webinar is one of our ongoing series for communities for gender equality. Now, my name is Tracy Babrick and I'm co-director of learning and network engagement with Community Foundations of Canada and I'm honored to be joined today with my colleague Amanda Watkins. Amanda is behind the scenes and will be working with us uh, monitoring our systems today but also as well will be following the chat box. As a national organization, Community Foundations of Canada operates across the traditional lands of Turtle Island. The first community foundation in Canada was founded and established in 1921 in Winnipeg, Manitoba, Treaty 1 territory and the traditional land of the Métis and Ashinaabe Waki and the Ochi-Ti-Shakobin. Thank you for bearing with me. I am so honored to be able to pronounce that. <laughs> While our staff finds itself working remotely across five different provinces, it's easy to forget that while we may not each reside on or operate from the exact same location, our work is still grounded in the physical territory that is known as Canada. And our work is influenced and affected by the various communities within, our, within which our staff live. Now today I'm connecting to you with you from my home in Grand Prairie, Alberta which is Treaty 8 territory, on the, and which is the traditional lands of the Maidy, the Kelly Lake Maidy Settlement Society and the Beaver First Nation. And I am grateful to work, live and learn on the traditional, traditional territory of Treaty 8, as well to share this land with the founders and the settlers that open the lands and the community that I live in today. And I'm honored to share the journey to continue to explore how I can understand and learn more about the lands that I live on. So as we get started, a couple friendly uh, items to just remind you of for as we get ready for today's webinar, is you can see us and you can hear us, but we cannot see and hear you. So please do use the chat box for your questions and also for your thoughts. This session is scheduled for 90 minutes and is offered in both French and in English, and you can access your preferred language in the language area at the bottom right of your screen. We will also um, share this, we will, following the presentation of a 60 minute presentation, we'll then move into a 30 minute question and answer period. And we also encourage you to as well, um, follow us in the gallery view. And we are recording today's webinar as well. And you will be able to access the recording following this session on our, in our, on our website in the resource library. So let's get started, friends. So today's topic is a continued conversation and a continued learning experience on gender equality and the complex dynamics, dynamics between what is equality and what is equity and how it applies to each of us in the philanthropic sector, but also as well to society at large. We're delighted to present this webinar today alongside future ancestries, alchemist Mo Feng. We are very delighted that Mo could join us and to share her knowledge and her learnings with us. Now, as we prepare to move into Mo's presentation, it's very exciting for me to share with you more about Mo. Mo is a second generation immigrant who was born in Yarkmouth, Nova Scotia. And they are the marine biologist, ocean technologist, artist, and photographers, photographers, pardon me, based in Halifax. Now Mo brings passion, she brings skill, and she brings commitment to understand opportunities for all. And Mo today will be sharing with us more of her learnings and her wisdom. And her learnings and her wisdom come from her experience as a community specialist for OceanWise and as a co-founder for Oceans Week F, pardon me, HFX, which is a youth-led initiative that supports the growing ocean community through relationship building, young engagement, and connecting community members with local businesses and organizations. 
Mo, ha Mo has experienced working with the no uh, Nova Scotia ocean sector and not-for-profits who work in the ocean conservation and education area. Their approach is to engage the ocean and the environment sectors to create climate justice frameworks and also to prioritize and racialize voices, relationships and connections. So it's an, an absolute pleasure for me to welcome Mo. Mo, I'm gonna turn the uh, program over to you now. Welcome. Thank you, Tracy. Um, I'm just hoping I can share my screen there. If you can allow me to do that and I'll, I will do that right away. It's okay if it takes a minute. Okay, perfect. All right. Is everyone able to see that okay? Yeah, okay, cool. Okay, everyone. Hi, um, I'm really excited to talk to you today about equality, equity, everything in between the differences and how they both are bound together and work together still. Um, I just want to let you know that I'll be presenting in English. And as Tracy said, there's an interpreter. Um, my slides have both English and French on them as well. Um, Tracy did a really good job at introducing me. Um, and so I'll just uh, go through this kind of quickly. My name is Mo, for those of you who don't know me. Uh, my pronouns are they, them, and she, her. I accept both of them interchangeably. So um, you can use both. Um, my work with Future Ancestors as an alchemist is mainly work in climate justice and anti-racism and how those intersect. Um, I am a second generation immigrant um, based in Halifax. My background's in marine biology, oceans technology, and was mainly working with animal physiology and then under, underwater camera systems. Um, I recently just joined the National Advisory Council for the platform, which is a civic leadership platform that amplifies and uplifts the voices of Black, Indigenous, um, and racialized young women and gender diverse youth. Um, Co-founder of Oceans Week Halifax, um, and on the chair of the Oceans Week Canada Committee. I was also part of the Ocean Bridge program, which is through OceanWise, if any of you have heard of OceanWise. Um, it's a program that brings together 160 youth from across the country, um, empowering them, giving them the tools and the resources they need to make a difference in ocean conservation. And a little bit about future ancestor services, if um, some of you I know had attended a previous webinar um, with Chuck and also some of you might be new. And so I will go over a little bit about us. Um, we're an indigenous and black owned youth led professional service that centers our work in equity and climate justice. And we do all of this in the context and through the lens of ancestral accountability. Um, the company launched just April of last year. And since then we've, um, grown a community of over 140 clients and we've mobilized over $40,000 of crowdsourced funding um, of donations that are then turned into grants. And these grants will be awarded to and given to those who are black, indigenous, racialized, LGBTQ2S+, disabled folks, all doing work in the frames of equity and climate justice as well. So I wanna start my land acknowledgement here um, with this quote. If you aren't immediately asking questions upon your arrival or of your ancestors arrival on the land you are on and about your role, history and relationship to that land, then there needs to be some questions asked about how we perpetuate contemporary colonial erasure and violence. And although this presentation is taking place online, I wanted to focus it um, and my acknowledgement on Ottawa, Ontario, um, to acknowledge where 
Community Foundations Canada is based. And so I also would like to pay respects to the Algonquin peoples who are the traditional guardians of the land, the urban Inuit who have largely settled in Ottawa, Indigenous peoples from across Canada who call Ottawa home, all the Black and non-Black peoples whose blood went into building this nation, and immigrants who fell in love with Ottawa and gave this land to their offspring and for generations to come. As a non-binary queer Vietnamese Canadian living in Canada, I would also like to pay respects to the Mi'kmaq people who have lived here, still live harmoniously with the land, the plants, the animals, the waterways, and who are the primary protectors um, of this land and first providers of this land. I also want to acknowledge and honor Black History Month because without Black folks who fought for the Civil Rights Act and for collective liberation, there would be no Asian Canadian history and I wouldn't be here and my family wouldn't have been able to come here um, because the Immigration and Nationality Act wouldn't have passed without the work and the leadership of Black folks. So before we kind of dive into the core of the presentation, um, I want to just go over Brave Spaces and, and how we use this space differently um, from a safe space. Creating a Brave Space um, is a huge part and a key part in, in how to build a work environment that's equitable and how to practice the, um, navigating those kind of spaces and facilitating in them. So these are kind of concepts to keep in mind as you move forward through the presentation. And then you can carry this on into your other work too and in those spaces that you're in. So although the origin of the term brave space seems to be unclear, we do know why it's important and why we choose to use it. Um, it's to amplify, uplift, to value the marginalized and oppressed community members um, around us. The term safe space has many uses and, and it ultimately has centered in the past um, increasing overall safety of a space. Um, but the differences with brave spaces, it does that while also prioritizing and, and attending to those marginalized voices. Since the history behind the term demonstrated that if people, um, people have used this in different ways and so I just wanted to be clear on how we use this at Future Ancestors and how I'll be using it today. So there's five kind of main um, areas of a brave space that are relevant for today and relevant um, for a lot of online webinar work that we've been doing. So controversy with civility. And this is where varying opinions are accepted while in this space. Owning intentions and impacts. So in the case of you and your coworkers um, are in this space, you are required to kind of acknowledge and discuss um, instances that are affecting the well-being and the emotional well-being of your colleagues. Challenge by choice. So this is where you and your coworkers have the option to step in and out of challenging conversations as you wish. And so just keeping that in mind today, you are able to take a moment if you need to step away or kind of take some time to process or digest. Um, and we can do that and come back into the discussion period together. Respect, so showing you and your coworkers, showing yourself and your coworkers respect um, and no attacks. So you and your coworkers and us being here in this space, we agree to not intentionally inflict harm um, towards anybody in this space. So what is the difference between equality and equity? There's many ways to, to kind of describe it depending on the space that you're in. And so I'll define these terms kind of in the context of being in and amongst and navigating, facilitating community foundations and networks. So, one way to define equality is ensuring that every individual has an equal opportunity to make the most of their lives and talents. In other words, equality is ensuring that everyone has the same opportunities and receives the same treatment and support. 
Equity, on the other hand, is about giving people what they need in order to make things fair, giving more to those who need it. So for example, in an equal school system, um, students would be given the same resources and tools in order to learn. Um, but in an equitable school system, resources are given to students based on their individual needs and what they require to learn. So there's three types of equity that we can keep in mind as we move forward today. Um, one is representational equity. And that um, is in regards to participation at all levels of an institution. The second is resource equity. And so this is the distribution of resources um, in order to kind of close in on those gaps, those equity gaps that we see. And then the last one is equity, equity mind, mindedness. So that demonstrates um, the awareness and willingness to address equity issues. So we'll be thinking about these as we talk about equality and equity um, throughout the rest of this talk. So when we look at these terms together, we know equality implies sameness and equity implies fairness. And to think about both of those terms, we need to think about how when we're achieving equality and we're striving to do that, we need to remember that the end goal is equity. And so let's say um, there's resources being given to a group of people who are all exhibiting and expressing different needs. Um, they need to survive and thrive in either their work or their housing or something like that. And so when we think of equity in this case, we need to not think of sameness, but, but of fairness because the individual person, their community, their families and so on, we don't wanna think about fairness as a way to compare these two terms. Um, we don't wanna kind of put them against each other. When we say things are fair, we need to ask ourselves, who is benefiting from the fairness and is making things fair, satisfying the one who's already benefiting. And so thinking about what does fair mean and how that looks differently with different situations and different communities. So in saying that we, we need to shift kind of our focus um, um, and the aspect of fairness on how and how to achieve that. So, we need to think about those who have been systemically oppressed and marginalized. Um, and in the context of your own community foundations and initiatives and networks, thinking about how to achieve that, again, with the end goal as equity. So I'm gonna look into a couple of case studies here with you and, and talk about um, this first one, which is in inequalities in the workplace. And so according to a 2016 study um, by the Institute of Women's Policy Research, black women were shown to make only 62.5% of what men made that year. So this also showed that the equal pay day for African-American women didn't, wasn't put in place or did not occur until later in that year. So according to the black so the status of black women of the United States, um, black women had been turning out for elections at such high rates, they were showing an increase in advanced degrees, undergrad, undergrad degrees, and opening and starting businesses at an exponential rate. And that's what the study was kind of saying is that all of this progress and black women were still unable to move that needle because of this systemic oppression and get paid fairly for their work. So black women had to work almost 20 months to earn what men earned in 12 months. And so it's that date that shows us that black women working full time all throughout 2017 and then far into 2018 would only earn the same amount as, the, as men did in 2017. And this was kind of put in place because 
when John F. Kennedy signed into the Law of Equal Pay Act, the law made it illegal to pay men and women working different salaries for similar work. And so we need to unlearn and kind of recreate the world we want to live in, um, thinking about equitable pay. What are the inequalities in the workplace? How do they differ from different workplaces? And thinking about this um, through a collective and community mindset, um, collaborating more with others who are experiencing the same kind of inequalities and listening to them. Another case study that looks into the inequalities of a workplace. Last month, Joe Biden repealed Donald Trump's ban on openly transgendered people serving in the military. And so this is something that I've been seeing all over the media um, lately. And some of you might have seen this as well. Um, he has promised the nation, the broader world that we live in because we're so affected by what happens in the United States. This was his promise to the LGBTQ2S plus community. And so we'll look at the case of um, a person named Nick Talbot. He is an openly transgendered person and has wanted to be in the army for years. He wanted to be an intelligence officer. But instead, since this law that was put down by Donald Trump, he has been a shelf stalker, a substitute gym teacher, driving a delivery truck, working night shifts, being a delivery driver, all because he was not able to have that opportunity based on his gender. And so he's an openly transgender person and then banned from serving in the US military. He's been trying to join the military for most of his adult life and According to the US military, you have to have college degree, pass a bunch of physical tests and have high scores, um, have the spotless record. And this is what Nick did. And Nick had all of these credentials and more and was exhibiting all of the things you need to be a qualified candidate to be in the US military. And yet was still turned away and told that he wasn't allowed to be in the US military because of a gender marker on his papers. And so what does this show us? We see that there's still those who are in power, in control, and who still make these laws and these rules that are negatively impacting many people of diverse, gender diverse identities. And what we don't actually hear about all the time is when we read news and articles about these issues that these people in power had a choice. We only hear about the choice that they made. So they had a choice to make this ban or not, but the choice needs to come from a deeper understanding of the inequalities and inequities that exist and that are being faced by folks in their own communities. And so we saw this choice that happened before this ban was by the Obama administration. This administration structure allowed people who had transitioned to a new gender to join the military. So this continued on for helping others realize that they too could be included in this and, and helped motivate folks to who were openly transgender to pursue the careers and pathways that they wanted to. And so in July 2017, before the new transgender policies could be fully in place, Trump was apparently under pressure from conservatives and made this ban through social media. So we just see kind of this pattern of power that's being abused and this abuse of power is ultimately destructing of lives um, in our communities. Another case study we can look at here is thinking about intersectional feminism. And so we have often heard of like the women's day movement and feminist movements that are happening in different places in the world. 
But to look at this case study and talk about the intersectionality of it, um, feminists of color at, at Define America Film Festival in 2018 demanded the practice of intersectional feminism from white feminists in order to strengthen the women's movement. So there's a quote by A. Jen Pu, who is the co-founder and executive director of the National Do Domestic Workers Alliance. And she was saying, when you are a black woman or a queer immigrant woman, your experience of violence isn't gender inequality plus racial inequality, but it's all of those things at once. So we see multiple ways that people are being marginalized and oppressed um, based on their exclusion um, in this kind of work. And so internet intersectionality, as you've heard probably in the media and you've been learning about maybe in your own work, it's basically the framework that was developed by Black feminist scholars to help people understand what it's like to be affected by multiple forms of injustice and multiple forms of oppression. And white feminism is a subcategory of the feminist movement. And so this white feminism tends to prioritize and advocate for white folks, heterosexual folks and cisgender folks and it's such a powerful movement, but it often lacks um, attention towards sexism. Um, for instance, it, it kind of leaves out um, the intellectual labor and emotional labor that has gone into this work. So around this, the intersections of gender and along with other forms of oppression, um, these things can all exist at once. And, and so being mindful of that work, if you, are a part of feminist movements and, and learning about that on your own, just to kind of think deeper and, and think about the lived experiences and, and stories about um, other folks who are in this movement too. So in order to progress further into this work in a genuine way, intersectionality and feminism can only truly be achieved um, by listening to marginalized people. So this isn't uh, like, this doesn't really look like just bringing up, you know, a story or a name of a woman of color in a conversation that you're having, but instead letting them speak for themselves and on behalf of themselves, sharing their own experiences, their own narratives um, and present that to you and present that to your group. So taking time to build an intentional relationship um, and making room for communicating on what that can look like. And so those three case studies all are touching on things that are currently very much in action and very much happening in the world today. Um, and I would like to kind of talk to you about climate change and how that's connected with gender because there's so many inequalities that affect um, women mostly when it comes to climate change. And so it's kind of a good way to, th to think about an all encompassing um, umbrella to all of these other issues. So how are gender and climate change connected? What is climate change? So climate change can be defined simply as the altering of weather patterns, but Ultimately, climate change is a secondary issue. We see that we're always talking about climate change and there are several climate change organizations, um, agencies and groups, and they're all built around the idea of climate change. But it's not climate change that we can tackle. Um, we can talk about climate change and we can ring all the alarms about it, but we can't do anything in a direct way. Climate change is intersectional. So it does not affect everyone and impact everyone equally. It, climate change negatively impacts indigenous women uh, more than non-indigenous women and women more than men and transgender people are impacted more than cis people. 
So climate change is negatively affecting vulnerable people, vulnerable communities, mostly women, at a higher and faster rate than anyone else. Climate change also reveals the difficulties that are faced by indigenous communities, whether that's the loss of land, resources, uh, food security, um, violation of their human rights, uh, further discrimination, higher rates of unemployment, and so on. And since climate change is already impacting poor farming communities, for example, this is leading our world to become politically unstable because unstable because people are fighting over these resources. Um, and we're seeing an increase in climate refugees, which are mostly women and children. Um, so we see an increase and a need for conversation and need for action around the racism happening and the oppression of minorities um, when it comes to talking about intersectionality and climate justice. So according to Amnesty International, there was a, there is an increased rate of gender-based violence when a natural disaster occurs too. And so we see this link and relationship between climate change and gender. And as an individual, you ask yourself, you know, who do you represent and like, how do you identify? Who are you able to speak for? How can you carry your message and also carry the message of those who are voiceless and have less power than you? And these are kind of things to think about when you're moving through your work and, and thinking about the ways you are benefiting from the things around you, thinking about other folks who are being oppressed in the same kind of work. So that's why it's important to talk about the intersections of identity, um, whether it's race and gender and culture and many more, we need to talk about this um, in community level conversations. So why is climate justice important to all of us? So there's a myth that we hear and that is occurring a lot in climate change talk where only white women care about the climate. But the truth is that many studies and research have shown that racialized women care about the climate, but are often the ones protesting, organizing on the front lines, and also are being impacted negatively from climate change. So climate change acknowledges the imbalances where there's a fight for the environment while also a fight for social justice. The when Black, Indigenous, and women of color who are apparently not fighting for climate change, they're, they're fighting for their human rights, they're fighting for their communities to not be destroyed or taken away, and they don't have additional energy to fight against climate change and like in the ways that we see that are portrayed in the media. And so this means that the inequalities and inequities present here shows us that we shouldn't have to be fighting against climate change while also fighting for our right to exist. And there's this really good quote that I read um, by Nitya Rao that says, these disadvantages already exist for women, but the unpredictable climate, women sometimes have to make preemptive decisions about whether their crop will survive or if their livestock will survive this season. And sometimes they are forced to make risky decisions. So the uncertainty that comes with climate change is particularly hard on women. This quote kind of tells, says a lot and really kind of sums up what um, was on the other slide. And I wanna bring up another quote by a climate scientist named Kate Marvel. And she says, I'm worried not of what the climate is doing to us, but what we will do to each other. So after talking about the gaps in pay and wages in the workplace for women, non-binary folks, tra transgender folks, there exists this problem of gender um, inequality such that Senior leadership roles, positions of power um, are still being centered around and with men. Um, we do see this changing in lots of ways, but 
when we look at the trend of how many organizations and what level of an organization they're at, whether it's a federal, national, provincial, regional, we can see that there's still more men in control than women here um, when it comes to operating businesses and companies. So this can mean that the impacts of climate change we see um, where the most wealthy individuals, let's say, there's a natural disaster, there's a state of emergency around you. These are the folks with likely more access, more money and resources to be able to sell their homes and move themselves or their families somewhere that's more safe and that's better for them. And so as marginalized communities who are mostly located on coastlines um, in lots of countries around the world, these women and families are being the most impacted by climate change, but relocating and having resources to move themselves out of their homes to protect themselves or provide a better place for their families is likely not an easy option or an option at all. So we see that there also exists this very real mindset um, that's really harmful that can be described as an individualistic mindset versus having a collective mindset. And ultimately we need a collective mindset, thinking about community, thinking about um, the people surrounding you and who are in your daily lives. We need to think collectively in order to survive. So in many poorer countries, services like childcare, clean water, affordable food resources, um, these are put out of reach from these families that need it the most. So making these services more widely available, more equitable, addressing them in equitable approaches will then alleviate this climate related stress and burden that is held on women. So this is what climate justice looks like. Climate justice insists on a shift from a discourse on greenhouse gases and melting ice caps into a civil rights movement with the people and communities most vulnerable to climate impacts at its heart. So in addition to this inequality of emissions happening in communities where they aren't the ones that are contributing to these emissions, um, but they're being the most impacted. And since we are all impacted by the climate at the end of the day, this affects our access to food and resources and materials and things that are coming from outside of Canada. So when we talk about intersectionality and gender, we need to think about these exclusionary behaviors that contribute to these problems that are arising and to these inequities and inequalities happening in the workplace um, and at higher levels of leadership roles where decisions are being made. So we need to move away from individualizing social issues, placing modern science above lived experience of people that are most impacted, trying to create the distinction between issues of gender and social justice, and not acknowledging who's at the table when you make these decisions. So intersectionality here takes into account the historical, the social, the political context, and really recognizes the experience of the individual and allows for that to be acknowledged and remedied where needed. So what can you do? After talking about all of these case studies and learning about information about gender and climate change, um, one thing you can do is situate yourself within Canada's uncensored history. Understand the racial dynamics that are existing here in Canada and why they exist. You know, situate yourself as an individual, as the leader of your own community foundation, as a leader of your own initiative, and think about how the systems of power and oppression have contributed to the history of this country and ask yourself how you can contribute um, your privilege, your resources into empowering those marginalized communities and, and helping those impacted. 
um, fighting for gender equality and equity with the collective mindset. Secondly, being intersectional in your innovation. So recognizing that your community foundation or your projects and your strategies, um, thinking about who they actually have a positive impact on. And this then can help you recognize who you're missing and why you're missing them from the conversation. And you can map out how your operations are impacting these vulnerable people. And if you do, identify an area where you're harming folks or a different community of folks than are in your community foundation, then think about what kind of steps you can take to attend to that harm and to fix that harm. Because we know that community organizations um, and initiatives right now are the greatest agents and drivers of social change. And we have so much impact that we can make in a good way so recognizing and taking responsibility for that. And lastly, creating intentional partnerships. So to build intentional and genuine partnerships with those who don't identify the same way as you, it takes time. And so you aren't on your own in this and you don't have to create solutions or innovate on your own. And we're here today, there's 74 of you um, present right now and you have community, you have tools here. And so it's never too late to start that conversation and use what you have, what you know, what you're learning to really think about how to move towards a more equal and more equitable society. Thinking about your role in community also, um, bringing together organizations and ask yourself how you can support them. So when you're talking to an organization that you wanna learn more about, that you wanna build a partnership with, do a lot of listening, practice listening to what they need and how they can, they, they can benefit from your support. And also bringing together people who are the ones being impacted or organizations that represent those people being impacted. Ask your, asking yourself, who are the marginalized folks excluded from these conversations and these decision-making roles? Um, and then you're able to move towards the co-creation of abundance for everybody that you're working with and that you're around. And so I'll end off on this quote um, by Dr. Ayana Johnson. Um, she says, building community around solutions is the most important thing we, we can do. So we need to understand our role in nature. We are one species and our individual actions ultimately create a collective impact. And so I'm really trying to drive home the collective mindset versus the individualistic mindset. And this is what will help in all of our solution building, our capacity building. Um, so situating ourselves in community like you all are in your own foundations and initiatives is a huge step in the right direction. So thank you for listening um, and thank you to Amanda and the team at Community Foundations Canada um, for having me here today. Oh, thank you so much, Mo. Uh, you know, I have got about two and a half pages of notes, <laughs> thoughts and wisdom that you've shared with us today. And we've had a couple of questions uh, that have come into the chat box as well. Um, first, really beautiful to see the acknowledgement and thanking you for sharing uh, your your thoughts. And, you know, as Andrea mentions here, very thoughtful, but very important conversation that we're hosting today. Uh, a question that came to me privately is, um, what is something that, uh, sorry, let me just grab it to make sure I read it correctly. What is something that you wish you knew about equality in the workplace when you first started this, this journey? And do you have some tips for people who want to advocate for themselves and their peers? Yeah, I could talk about the experience of it as of inequality in a workplace all day. I feel like I, I just recently left a job. Um, I'm always kind of working multiple avenues, but this job I, I felt 
was first of all, kind of, you kind of going to look at the, stru the structure of your organization, you know, who's, is it a hierarchical structure? Is it a pyramid structure? Um, then you can decide how you're going to navigate conversations and bring up issues because sometimes when it looks like this and you're down here, you're like talking at a wall and you can't really express or make moves in the directions you want to make. And so for me, I felt like I was being tokenized and I was always asked for my advice and my ideas, my creativity, but was never credited or, or valued in that. Um, and so I found what helped me the most was, you know, if you're working in a, let's say you, everyone's workplace looks different, obviously, but find one or two people or um, however many people you can in your group that you can trust to talk to um, before going into talking about how you can address it at, a, at an organizational level or with your supervisor or your boss. Um, I found that was really helpful and really helped me find the confidence to talk on these issues because I did spend a lot of time, you know, asking myself if I was overreacting, if I was second guessing myself all the time. And I spent so much time doing research on how to tell something to my boss than actually doing my job. And so when you find the right time to talk about inequalities and inequities in your workplace, in your community, um, to try to do it as soon as you feel like you have the confidence in, to do so, because um, it's really detrimental to kind of everything else in your life if something is really weighing on you in that way. And then it really makes you think differently about your abilities and your capabilities. I hope that answered your question. I got it. Why not? Uh, Mo, that was tremendous. And a couple of things that really were highlighted there around the feeling of being tokenized and also having the supports to be able to, to move in the journey together and really mindful of your experiences and your learnings. And thank you for sharing your personal component, your personal reflections on that. Um, there's a couple of questions in the chat box there. We have one from Stephanie around concerned about the lack of affordable internet options for indigenous and our rural communities and estimating that 30% of our Indigenous communities in Canada are living without reliable internet access. And so reflecting on that, how can communities advocate for these needs during the pandemic? And um, if there are experiencing bar barriers on staying connected, how can we support them? And I know this is a topic we've, we've been really mindful of as well at CFC around how can we help to lead? And we have some future things coming up around this, but I'm really intrigued on your thoughts and what we could do and what our community foundations can do to help to move forward. Hmm. Yeah, that's a, that's a huge and major issue right now. And I've come across this conversation in my work a few times lately. And um, I just saw in the chat, there's some resources in different provinces that uh, are, are the mobilizers of this, but in my internship with Ocean Bridge, there were youth in my program who um, lived in Pond Inlet and in Cambridge Bay. And, and I got to hear their stories and experiences and I obviously can't speak on behalf of them but to be able to share kind of what I've learned um, to contribute to this question in this conversation is that you can never assume what is best for other people, um, especially when you are the one benefiting from privileges and resources that aren't available to everybody. So I found that It's, it comes down to kind of that genuine intention of creating partnerships is, is listening and being patient and um, 
it's kind of what we do at Future Ancestor Services is that we have a decolonized timeline in the way we work where the way we think about urgency is different and the way we reply to clients is different if they're working under kind of like an urgent timeline and we have to remember that we have the control to say, you know, this is when this thing will be attended to and this is how it's working in my my experience and my timeline. So when my friends from Pond Inlet and Cambridge Bay were like, have a conversation, start the conversation generally don't come to us saying we work here we this is my job title this is what we want to do so refraining from saying all the things that would then end up benefiting you and your organization just start by asking you know what do you need to to do this program what do you need in order to attend this thing online and that it's I think it's has a lot of layers on what internet can look like but also how do we innovate and create different ways to communicate you know um, thinking about not always offering our services or not always offering what you're what you have to teach in an online platform, you know, it's going to take effort and more work to kind of customize that to the needs of everybody. And I think that's why it's so important to think in that intersectional mindset is like, there's lots of pieces that you need to think about that we're not used to thinking about. I think a lot of times in our society, we're used to thinking in like a one channel mind where like, we're given a project, we have an objective, you do the things you need to do step by step and then you have your results but we don't think about all the other bits where it's like okay well how is this going to affect this group or this community if we take that step and then what's the next step mean if we can't and so a whole restructure is required there and I, this is like uh, another conversation we can have sometime but um I, we can go to another question <laughs> uh, Mo, thank you so much. I'm so mindful of your experience and, and your wisdom. And, you know, we, we talked about tokenism a few moments ago, and it's brought another com comment out and another question around if you could speak more on tokenism and how can we ensure we are respectful of an individual and yet broaden our understandings and the challenges that um, our marginalized individuals may be facing. So, you know, really, um, I know in some of the work that I've done, both with CFC and outside of, tokenism continues to come up. And I know myself, I've personally also wondered, how do I pause and be mindful of that? Yeah, this is, I feel like, I don't even remember that I go through this on a regular basis. And I think it's become so kind of, numb or like where I experience anger or frustration with tokenism is 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 like pushed to the side but it's so real and it's so a reason why I work at Future Ancestors now is because it's probably the only workplace that I've been where I don't feel this way um in the past let me think of like a way that someone has approached me and then how it made me feel and what I would suggest could be different in that way. Um, um, I guess, yeah, previous job that I had, it's like, let's say your foundation or your organization, you realize that your whole board and all of your directors um, are white identifying um, people. And then such as last year, we see this kind of hunger and this motivation to now change what that looks like. Um, and so I think a lot of mistakes that people made were sending emails or kind of 
requests and asks that were only questions on how they could be better or they could do a better job at their work. But I think questions that need to be asked, and this is something that I'm still coping and learning about, coping with and learning about is when someone approaches me and, and wants to do work with me, um, I love for that to be a conversation about who they are and like where they came from and what, what brought them to the work, why do they love their work? And then kind of talk about, you know, this is what our work does and this is what we've seen you do or know you that you work in. And we would love to hear what you have to offer, hear what you um, would like to share. And it's like what I said in the previous question, kind of like not stating what you need from them before asking if they're even interested or, or if they would like to collaborate or be a part of another conversation. I think the first thing is, um, yeah, if you're saying what you want from me or somebody else, then it's like a red flag on, okay, I know, I know what your intention is, but the impact you're making on me is, is bad, it's negative. And so that's another thing is thinking, you have good intentions, of course, but what impact are you creating when you haven't really thought thoroughly or deeply about the intention you wanna make? Some very, very wise words. And, you know, I'm, I'm really mindful of that pause and listening and that pause and listening, very powerful, very powerful today. Uh, I'm gonna move to Claire's question as well. She's looking for examples uh, in regards to positive innovation uh, and, and messaging and how to really look at framing some of uh, some innovative opportunities through uh, messaging. Do you have some thoughts to share around opportunities that Claire and the others may consider? Um, is this question in the chat or was that sent to you? I just, it's kind of, you can read it again and, and then I okay. can. So it's, she says, what Claire is saying in relation to number two regarding messaging, can you please give an example of a positive innovation, you know, in regards to messaging or ask the group if they have examples from their foundations? Hmm. Yeah, I'm not sure. At, like right in this moment. Um, I would love to hear others share what they think too and maybe that can kind of spark a discussion mm -hmm. with others. And if Claire, or if Claire would like to also, she wants to add anything else there, that would be wonderful as well. Um, you also touched on decolonization and decolonized um, earlier as well and how we continue to be mindful in our, our in our thoughts and our approach. Um, do you have anything else, Mo, that you'd like to share with us on how you, how you um, would provide thoughts to our teams here that are with us today and what um, they could consider as well? On kind of how to approach folks mm -hmm. who have a decolonized timeline or do you take that kind of approach and work? Yes. Yeah, so for example, I can share a personal experience that happened with me um, working in the ocean sector. I experienced this a lot where I was, and I know I'm not the only one experiencing this, but it's kind of this, the urgency aspect, you know, it's like um, I was sent an email asking with like caps and bold text for something to be done for them for the next day. And I was honestly, I thought it was a joke. And, and it's kind of this looking at this person's situation and the power and the privilege that they had. It's like, they didn't even think twice to, to email me expecting me to send this thing. Like I have nothing else going on that day or do anything with, else with my time, but attend to emails 
of urgency from other people. And I'm, I'm learning and I have learned a lot about how to kind of digest that and think, okay, it's not about me and how this person's reacting, but that doesn't stop me from showing them a reaction or showing them a response that they never heard of or that they're not used to hearing. And so the way I responded to that was like, thanks for your request and your interest in the service that you want from me, but this is the time I can have it done for you. Um, and just being clear kind of with your capacity. And it's really hard to do that sometimes and say no to things and, and put things to the side. But um, for the benefit of your mental health, I think being able to stay stay in kind of control of that and, and being aware of, of your mind and your body and your health. For me, when I said, sent that to them and said, this is actually the, the time I can do it. Um, but in my head saying, you know, I don't appreciate the way that you're talking to me, but sometimes you can't, like you ha I have to suppress that part of me sometimes. And it's something I'm working through and I don't wanna be able to suppress that, but um, to navigate in this society, there's this happening all the time and you're learning and you're navigating, you're moving, you're stepping back, you're stepping forward. And so, and this person said, thank you so much, that sounds great. It's like, okay, well then you didn't need it the day tomorrow, right? You kind of like this, some people are used to, you know, um, that instant, getting that thing instantly or getting what they want and say moving at the pace and not realizing that not everyone can meet you where you're expecting them to meet you. Um, and I was, I was wanting, oh, sorry. I just want to add one more thing um, and read a little part from our decolonized timeline statement. Um, I'll read this part here that says, how people culturally understand, use and relate to time has been weaponized as a tool of colonization and addressing how contemporary societal, organizational, and personal practices continue this legacy is important in building relationships with Black, Indigenous, and racialized communities. Future Ancestor Services prioritized a de prioritizes a decolonized experience of time. Collectively, we work together with our clients and stakeholders to consider how diverse cultural understandings of what time means can be incorporated into your work and your events. So that kind of sums it. <laughs> it, it truly does. Um, and Mo, I, I, as you can see by the comments that are coming in, that even around the aspect of messaging, really truly being mindful of the stop, pause and listen um, at the very onset. So, you know, I think you've answered a couple questions there with your beautiful story, but also and the journey that you've traveled and what you've learned from that journey. Um, we have another question that's come in too as well, and it's how can we help to ensure brave spaces do not put undue burden on marginalized voices while still amplifying these important voices? I don't think that, well, thank you for this question. First of all, I feel like asking about brave spaces is so good and it's such a good conversation to have with people and your friends and your circles. But I don't think it's, I feel like if you were to bring up a brave space and the option of having a brave space and you know, if you're hosting a webinar like this or a meeting of some sort, it's definitely, not a burden, but it, it's mostly brave spaces are for folks who aren't the marginalized folks. You know, it's for folks to be reminded that, hey, there's other people in this space that share different identities than you and share different cultures and backgrounds than you. So this is like a reminder checklist of, you know, 
how to be human to human and not let your daily, your privileges get in the way of that. Um, so I think it's, if I was to walk into an event where they were like, Brave Space is our mandate, this is what we're doing, we're committed to this, I would feel like I could take a deep breath and be like, okay, so maybe I'll come into this space and not be, you know, talked over or, or be, or say something and then someone repeat everything I said, but using bigger words, you know, like creating that safe space narrative helps create that like relief in the room for marginalized folks to be themselves. And then that's how you're going to be able to build a genuine relationship is by uh, upfront stating, you know, what kind of space you're looking for and like what kind of atmosphere and, uh, and environment you want for your work relationship moving forward. Um, you know, there's something that's coming to my mind, Mo, is your, you speak from deep within, from your soul in a very mindful way. And I'm watching the chat. I'm, I'm, I'm sharing your journey with you today and all of us here today. And I'm, I'm really mindful of your very clear and very soul, soulfulness that's come out today, but in a very sharing, but also extremely engaging manner. And so I'm really, really honored that we could share this time to today um, and really honored that you've taken and shared your stories, your, your lived examples and your journey with us. Um, you know, Leanne Hammond has made a comment there and, you know, I'm looking at her comment and I can appreciate the energy where she is, you know, as she says, she's tired and feeling, you know, the completely uncomfortable conversations now with, with donors and really well intended, but, you know, there's still some of those, uh, that time where it is, it's difficult. Um, I'm, do you have some thoughts to share with me on based on her, her comments there? Yeah, I'm just reading it over. Um, also, I was hoping if I could request kind of like a transcript of this chat so I can like read it over later and, and mm -hmm. the things that I've missed. Yes, definitely will. Mm. Yeah, having uncomfortable conversations, all well-intentioned, but yeah. So the other day when I was talking to a group and presenting, I, I, I was saying how they had questions on, you know, they have a work timeline, have a project timeline, proposal timeline or, or whatever, but, and they put in what they need, what their funding needs them to do, you know, what their mandate requires from them. But what I find um, is not included in those needs and essential requirements of the strategy or policy is like space for things to happen, space for conversation, space for building relationship. It's like, it's so often where we're expected to, you know, connect with organizations, collaborate, but we don't think about how much time that actually takes and it's not the same amount of time for everyone you're talking to, you know. Um, being able to give yourself more space and, and, and room to, to have these genuine relationships is, is gonna help solve those problems of people you know, emailing you urgently and requiring things of you. They're not thinking about how to do that well, you know, they, so I think what's something we need to work on and, but it's so hard, especially in a pandemic and everyone's under all kinds of different stresses and, and layers in their own lives to think about, you know, where are we gonna find the time and space for everything? But it's just steps and, and small steps and learning that we can do. Well, I'm, I have to share, um, I am so honored again with your wisdom, your thoughts, and 
I'm really mindful of the time that we also have. We've got a few moments left. So if anyone would like to post another question or any other last thoughts before we, we close today's session off, um, now is the time. Uh, Mo, I would also, um, we, can we share your email address with, um, on, with this team too as well? Yeah. Um, yeah, wonderful. That sounds wonderful. So we have another question here too as well. That's just wonderful, perfect, Mo. Um, another question from Jennifer there, you'll see too as well, around the need for space for stuff of what is happening in the context of gender equality grants and that our grantees are carrying such a load right now and you know, working on building the relationships and the pressure still of 50% you know, of those funds being spent, which is part of some of our, our funding programs. So how can we slow down and also be really mindful of our groups we're working with and share this path with them and this journey with them in a mindful pause and pause when we need to, or when we can, sorry, wrong words. Pause, let's pause. <laughs> I've learned that from you today. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I'm like pretty known for, you know, taking it a step back and easier, um, not easier all the time, but a little slower. I've, it's helped a lot in my work pace too. Um, thinking about, yeah, your partners and your funders, um, yeah, and pressure spending your funds at the end of your fiscal and that's what we're kind of hearing a lot about right now um, from folks who um, are feeling so much pressure from their work and their colleagues or whatever um, for the end of March and um, how to slow things down. I mean, the first thing I think about is like, how at a government federal level can we have leniency or flexibility in that date or how, how money is spent and when it's spent you know and that's obviously something that might be out of our control right now and and i wonder if um if there's a way to relieve that pressure of the grantees you know um fe feeling this kind of overwhelming weight that's being carried by lots of different people in their workplaces because um, I think that also as we move day to day right now we're not talking about how heavy that invisible stress of COVID is and that stress of the pandemic. Um, it's something that we're affected by every day and and I think feeling that extra weight in our work is is no doubt going to happen and it's happening right now um yeah I don't know I will think about this though um and, and, and I want to follow up on this question I think it's going to be something that everybody will and and even me like to think about how to do that so I will note this for sure. <laughs> oh, thank you so much as well again, Mo. And you know, I, I, that pause again, that's having that space and that pay, that place to pause, it will be a piece that I think will be really uh, definitely supportive of our movement as we move through so much. And again, recognizing we're all dealing with COVID and all the other variables too that, that come with COVID. So this has been a very, very valuable discussion today and really, truly appreciate your sharing. Um, if there's no last words, we'll get prepared to close off today. Um, but um, do you have any other last thoughts, Mo, you wish to share before we close off? No, I just want to thank everyone for, you know, having me in for the interpreter. <laughs> mm. um, and for all the engagement in the chat, like I, I wasn't surprised by the amount of engagement. I've heard good things, you know, about Community Foundations Canada and and the dedication and the work. And so I just, I don't know, aside from this content and this presentation, just to just take care of yourselves in ways that might be overlooked right now, you know, 
take five minutes to sit down and, and just listen to a song really loud or like go eat your favorite snack or something. Just taking care of yourselves in little ways and then being ready to take on your work. Um, this is something I'm trying to do more and, and be better at for myself. And I just want everyone to also feel like they can do it too. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I, I share with you, you've, you have done that today. Mo, you have given all of us, all of our attendees, some beautiful tools, some insight, some learnings for all of us. And we're blessed to share this experience with you today. Um, and truly to all of you that have joined us today, we're so grateful for the work you are doing, your leadership and your care and kindness in your communities. And uh, you are reaching every corner of Canada, touching every corner of Canada and ensuring that Canada is strong. And we're learning this together. You know, I, uh, one dear soul said to me about four months ago, we're on a journey together. This isn't a destination. And so thankful that I, that was a learning for myself at that period for me to take. And I've held that in my heart as I continue to move through the journey that I am taking as well. Um, and I'm honored to share it with everyone. I'm going to now just share the screen um, to share what's up and coming with some other activities that we have um, taking place in the next little bit with community and our Learning Institute area. So just back to our, our events page and also as well, our resource library. Um, as noted today, we're on a journey and we're sharing this journey with all of you. And we're honored with your sharing of coming together, being open and mindful that we are doing this together. Our gender equality series will continue on into March. And I just realized that we've just made a change on the very first item that you'll see on the page there. But our, on our events uh, page, it's not posted as of yet, but we will have a session coming up on March 16th. So the correction is not the 10th, but it is the 16th of March. And that will be focused on how do we also now move into looking at institutional change within our organizations and you're starting to explore our unconscious biases and our conscious biases and some variables around how we can start to move forward in this journey of working within our institutions and our organizations. Um, for those that are involved in vital signs, we as well have a few more sessions coming up around vital signs to help you to be equipped and ready for vital signs for 2021. So you'll see the two sessions noted around identify your job geography and then also around understanding the platform, which is our database platform. Um, today, Amanda has also shared many great tools and resources with you in the chat box that come from our resource library and from outside of Community Foundations of Canada. And we encourage you to continue to follow our resource library. We are um, on an ongoing basis updating the resources and tools to ensure that you have the tools and we have the tools to be the best that we can and travel this journey again together. So do follow our resource library and two items that have just recently been released is we have our commitment to anti-racism tool, toolkit. And this is a very mindful toolkit that was created um, under the leadership of Amanda, who's with us today. And so I encourage you to definitely access that toolkit and utilize to the best that you can and reach out to us with questions and thoughts around it. And recognizing we still are in the pandemic, we have updated when our crisis guide. So when crisis strikes, uh, a guide for community foundation has been updated to reflect on the pandemic and another great tool for you too as well to have. And so as we close today, uh, again, thank you so much Mo for sharing you, your knowledge, your skill, your passion with all of us. Uh, we are blessed. We're very blessed to travel this journey with you. And I am honored that we could share today. And to everyone that's with us, we're very grateful that you could join us. And we do look forward to having you back at our next sessions. So all the best, everyone. Take care.